Okay, welcome to our forensic economics lesson on the role of the forensic economist. Uh, my name is Matthew Rosu, I'm with Susquehanna University. So, there is a National Association of Forensic Economics, and they have a statement of ethics. And if you wish to be part of the National Association of Forensic Economics, uh, you must actually affirm this statement of ethics. And we're going to take a moment. A lot of these are relatively common sense, but we'll go through what these ethical principles are. Uh, number one, engagement. Um, you know, do not give an invalid representation of any facts of the case. So number one is engagement. Do not give an invalid representation of the facts of the case. Right? I mean, kind of common sense. Fraud is bad. Don't give a fraudulent representation. Uh, number two, um, for those who are lawyers, this might be a, you know not quite as obvious, but there should be no contingency payments for an expert witness who's, who's a forensic economist. Uh, lawyers sometimes do take contingency payments where if they win the case, they'll get some percentage of, um, of the proceeds. But forensic economists kind of walk a fine line because you're an expert, if you're in a courtroom setting, you're an expert of the court, right? You're, you're giving objective facts to the court. But of course, one side is already hiring you. And that side is hiring you because they expect you to come up with an analysis. And, and they're not doing it because they think it hurts their case. They're doing this because they think it helps their case. So there's already of this weird line that the forensic economist kind of has to deal with. Contingency payments would just make it worse. Um, so as a forensic economist, you just ha you set a flat, you set a fee, you know, an hourly rate or perhaps even a flat fee. Most of the time it's an hourly rate um, for how much you would accept for any, for a particular case. You do not say, well, I'll accept so much and then if we win, I want a bonus or I want some percentage of the damages. That is not allowed. Um, it could get you in a whole heap of hot water in, in, within cases. So that's just not something that's, that's okay. Uh, diligence, this should make sense, right? If you're a forensic economist, um, should be using generally accepted practices and or theoretically sound economic methodologies if the practices aren't, is, aren't yet generally accepted. Disclosure, um, when you're presenting how you've arrived at a particular figure for damages in a particular case, you must give sufficient detail that somebody else could come up with the same figure. That way somebody else could question they had legitimate questions like, well, what happens if you use a different interest rate? Uh, some other expert then should be able to figure out, well, I could take all of this, and if I just changed the interest rate, we would have come up with this number. Um, so you, just, you need to provide sufficient detail so that can happen, so replication can occur. Uh, point number five, consistency. As mentioned before, you're, you're kind of, it's a fine line for an expert witness, but you're, as an expert in the court, right, the court, you're putting you under oath if you go in, on, in a courtroom case that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So number five should make sense in this regard. Whatever numbers you come up with, it, should be, it shouldn't matter whether it was the plaintiff or the defendant who hired you. It should be the same either way. Uh, assumptions, sources, and methods should remain the same. Now this does not mean that there are times that sometimes it would be higher or lower. That certainly could happen but you should be consistent with the methods you use regardless of you, whether you're hired by a plaintiff or a defendant for a particular case. Uh, step six, must stay up to date with the field. There are ways um, you can do this. There's conferences. Um, the Journal of um, Forensic Economics is an outstanding source to keep up to date on current things. And for those who are taking this uh, fraud and forensic class at Susquehanna University, um, you'll be getting familiar with a couple articles in particular in, from the Journal of Forensic Economics throughout our time together on this, uh, in this section of the course. Uh, number seven, discourse. This is um, an interesting, but I think a really important case. Um, so forensic economists are constantly, at least the good ones, trying to stay up to date on the field and trying to make sure the methods are correct, um, like methods that are using are correct. And if tricky cases come up, often can talk about, well, what do we do in this particular case? How do we best handle this issue? Um, don't cite oral remarks made by other forensics, uh, I should, sorry, should say forensic economists in an educational environment without permission. But if you're discussing something in an educational environment with another forensic economist, you're trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. 
Um, oftentimes those thoughts won't be fully formed or opinions could change as you're trying to kind of like logic your way through a particular issue and it would really be unfair to take the quotes from somebody who's just trying to figure out a particular issue without their permission so you you could give a misleading representation of somebody's view um, you could give somebody a bad name by doing this and this allows the educational environments to be much more free and open and that's really good for the field um, and point number eight, just be good citizens of the field of forensic economics. Um, so when might a forensic economist be needed? Uh, Martin's book, Determining Economic Damages, which, um, an outstanding book to use, has a partial, uh, has a list. This is a partial list from there, but it could represent um, in a class action lawsuit on the damages if a marriage is splitting up could help try to provide what, what compensation should be pro provided to one party or another. Uh, wrongful terminations, discriminations, or death, um, you know, cases where somebody is either wrongfully fired, um, discriminated against, or if there's a wrongful death, forensic economists could come into play here. Business transactions where there's disputes, wrongful arrest or imprisonment, and more. There are a number of cases where a forensic economist can indeed provide their expertise for a particular issue. So those are the cases. When would an expert's testimony, or when can it be used? When is it, when is it allowed? Uh, for this, there's something called the Daubert test. A judge can rule that an expert's me methodology holds by asking these questions. Does the theory or technique, can it, um, can it be tested? Has it been tested? Has this theory or technique or method been subjected to peer review and publication? What's the known or potential error rate? That's a big one, like how confident is the expert in the particular testimony they're giving and how can you quantify um, how often it might be higher or lower than a particular estimate that's given? Um, standards controlling the operation and you know, has this theory been gained acceptance within a relevant scientific community? That's our brief lesson on the role of a forensic economist. We'll see you next time.